Okay, I have uh, great expectations, David. I might get an answer to the enigma of Shirin Yuko. I've read that Shirin Yuko is a Japanese term for forest bathing, and I've read that Swedes pay ridiculous amounts of money to meet at a local subway station, walk out into the woods, sit on a tree trunk for 30 minutes, have coffee and go back, and they're happy for this. So we're going to talk about the Swedes' rather complicated relation to... Now that is yours, yes. yes. And mine is over here, I think so. Please, thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. It's, it's been a very interesting day. And uh, so my background is I'm a historian and an ethnographer of religion. And I have a background in Islamic studies. But lately I have sort of shifted my focus into secularity studies. And I have tried to delve into the ambiguities of Scandinavian secularity. And in this talk, I will say something about my, my latest book was about secularization and, um, and nature romanticism in Sweden. And I will say something and I'll try to attach or connect that uh, project to the theme of this conference and this talk. So the title is In Search of a Universal Sacrality. Do secular Scandinavians experience the sacred like Rudolf Otto? And... Uh, it, it has been uh, talked about earlier, but Rudolf Otto, as you know, defines the sacred in the famous quote, which goes like this. It's the feeling, the feeling of it, that is the holy, may at times come sweeping like a gentle tide pervading the mind with a tranquil mood of the deepest worship. It may pass over into a more set of lasting attitude of the soul, continuing, as it were, thrillingly vibrant and resonant until at last it dies away and the soul resumes its profane, non-religious mood of everyday experience. Um, so this is the sort of the basic of what we are talking here. And Michele, other as um, Jessica and others have talked about earlier, sort of um, uh, developed this concept and this dichotomy of the sacred and the profane. And uh, uh, Jessica Fraser said a lot of things about, uh, sort of summarized many of his, his main ideas. But another thing is that I want to bring up is this idea, first of the dichotomy between the sacred and the profane, and also of this human capacity, according to Eliade's understanding, to shift between sort of two domains of experience, the sacred and the profane. And in his writings, he also um, lifts forth that this is a capacity that also secular people um, have, uh, it sort of survives in secular culture. And one, examples, one example on that would be, for instance, when a very secular person goes to the grave of a, of a dead loved one. Um, and it's, um, it's customary or it's common that people then start to talk to that person or say a few words to the dead relative, even though she or he is dead. And in this practice, even if they understand that this is just a playful thing that you do, it's as if it was true and it just feels relieving in some, in some way. Uh, when talking to a dead relative, what you actually do is you suddenly behave as if death did not exist, as if temporal, linear temporal time was sort of for a little while abandoned. And that I think is a good example of a secular and also of course religious uh, shift between uh, the profane and the, and the uh, secular mindset in the Eliadian understanding of it. Uh, another example would be literature, uh, reading fiction. And as you know, secularization has been parallel with a complete explosion and, and uh, expansion of literature and also of films and other fiction, including Netflix series, actually, uh, in which you actually, for a little while, abandon the linear time and, and you have this changed... You travel back in time and you, you change to the normal linear time of, 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 of profane existence. Uh, so there is this idea of secularity, of, of uh, the profane, sacred profane dichotomy prevailing also in secular culture. And what I wanted to do now was to test this uh, on our, uh, the studies that we have done. So as you may know, and as, as Per already mentioned, uh, Sweden is, by certain measurements, an exceptionally secular country, although this turns out to be a much more uh, sort of 
um, complex situation that one may, may expect. Um, but still, 85% of Swede, Swedes in some surveys say that religion has no position whatsoever in their everyday life. And this is the topmost score in all countries. Maybe North Korea would have something similar. Uh, so it's quite extreme in, in certain, if we measure in certain ways. Also, if you ask people if they believe in, an, if, in a personal God, something like 15% says yes. So there is this, of, at least the self-image of a very far-reaching secularity in this country. And if you interview people, the secular Swedes, and I, I suppose this will be true also of other Scandinavians, about their secularity or about their view of religion, um, which, which is something that I've done um, quite a lot, uh, what you'll find is that they will say almost the same thing, all of them. So they will begin by saying that they're not particularly religious. Uh, they think religion is associated to violence and non-scientific understandings of the world, and, and they don't want to associate themselves to religion per se. Then they may say, may say something about their um, cultural affinity to sort of Lutheran, old Lutheran Christianity, although that is not religious in their understanding. And thirdly, many of them will say something about their relation to nature, to the forest or the open landscape. They will say something like this. Well, I'm not religious, but of course, sometimes when I sit on my porch in the, in the archipelago and I look out over the landscape, well, then I feel something. So, um, and this, this theme then is, uh, you could maybe say that many people in this country, uh, belonging to the majority population, it's easy for them to sort of agree to the statement that the forest is my church. And if you look in Swedish culture, in Swedish poetry, Swedish literature, this notion of the forest as a church or the forest as a, as a place for sort of uh, superseding religion somehow is a very common theme. It's like a trope in secular uh, Swedish culture. So what we have done then is to um, try to understand this by interviewing people who, have, who we have found visiting Swedish forests. And the people we've interviewed, which is a couple of hundred in, in all the Scandinavian countries, and I've interviewed 72 people in Sweden. Um, and they belong, they, are as a major, they belong to the majority population of this country. And the majority population of this country are... Uh, secular in the sense that they have a self-understanding uh, of being secular. They are urban. We have a 90% of the population which is urban. Uh, so it's a very urban country, much more urban than uh, many of us like to believe. Uh, and they're also middle class in terms of economical status. So these urban, secular, middle class Swedes who go out to the forest with their dogs or to walk these nature reserves uh, near to the cities where they live, what do they say when we ask them about uh, what the, the landscape or the forest or nature means to them. Um, and there are a few themes that reoccur that I will just uh, tell you something about. And a, a, a very uh, reoccurring theme is this idea of a different realm. Nature is something else, it's the other. You have your city life and then you go out and you take a break and you have this pause in this other world that the landscape provides. <laughs> Secondly, there's this... Uh, it's a common idea which you may be able to call a sensitivity to greatness. Uh, it's this idea of nature being beautiful and fantastic and the universe and uh, sublime even, even if that uh, particular idea is not so present as we had anticipated. Thirdly, there is what you could call a metaphorical connection. And this is uh, kind of interesting. When you ask people in this country about the forest, almost all of them answer with stories about themselves. So you will say, uh, tell me about this place. And I'll say, well, I've had a stressful last year, something like this. I've been, it's, it's been a tough year for me. I, I have some relational problems. I have to think about this. So there's this, uh, we soon came to realize when we did these interviews that there are two landscapes at play when you study the role of the landscape in the lives of these secular Swedes. And one landscape is the outer landscape of the lakes and the trees and the, and the, the fields. And the second landscape is what you could metaphor, metaphorically call them their inner landscape, like their relations, their relations, their development in their life, their troubles and so on. Uh, and they seem to come back, although they don't use this word metaphorical connection themselves. 
in the way people speak about their nature experiences, they come back to making this kind of metaphorical connections. So for instance, they will describe, and we also made these walking interviews when you walk with someone through the forest on their little daily walk and, and they talk about what they think about there. And so maybe you walk through this uh, dense forest and you come up to, 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 a, to a height and the landscape opens up. And then they will describe it as if this, the sort of the widening horizons of the landscape sort of reminds them of their own life and the, their, the path, their life path and how it has, it's open-ended sort of. So the open-endedness of their life path is sort of brought to mind by the open-endedness of the physical path they're walking in the forest. A second example would be uh, if you, you, sit, you walk in the forest and you look into the uh, foliage and um, see all the plants and the animal life and everything. And, and then you realize, especially if it's a wild sort of true uh, natural forest, that there is decay and sprouting life going on in parallel. And then this sort of this parallelism of, of life blooming and things dying is then reflected perhaps a bit depressively, uh, on their own life and how things disappear and new things come. And they sort of make this mirror reflection of what goes on in the landscape with what's happening in their own life. Third example of this metaphorical connection is uh, someone who, to, who he was uh, struggling with the diabetes. And he told us he had, he, when he had seen this uh, a blooming apple tree, um, and there was this blooming apple tree and go, he goes there and he, he, he looks at the individual flowers of this apple tree and he's, he realizes that not even one single flower is, uh, is perfect. They're all a bit flawed and bent or uh, none of them is perfect. They, they lack a leaf or something. And then he gets this epiphany that, oh, this is how nature is, uh, this imperfection is how nature is like and it's what we appreciate as beautiful and then this sort of reflects back on his own life situation so this type of connections between the inner and the outer landscape is something that comes again and again and of course it creates a deep connection then to this landscape because if the outer landscape if what goes on in the outer landscape also is what goes on in your own life as they perceive it well then you are not as alone with your problems as you would uh, expect to be otherwise. Uh, so one uh, striking find is that many people who, who walk out usually alone in the forest, they report to have a, a lessened feeling of loneliness. So they feel less lonely when they're alone in the forest than then when they are in the city with vibrant city life, uh, because they feel this sense of, of a deeper connection to other things living and to the animals and the plants, but also to like the universe at large somehow, um, which is something that they uh, repeatedly report. Finally, there's this uh, experience of authenticity. Um, and this is something that comes back in many different versions, uh, versions in our interviews. So one thing is that you feel sort of that you get connected to your own physical experience. You might so if, if you have walked in the forest, if you walk for two hours, you become sort of tired and it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to think if you do exercise or if you walk for a few hours. So you sort of come down into your body and you, you just become this moving body through the landscape. And this is something that people find very soothing and, and comforting. Also, um, some of the interviewees report that they stop thinking about their uh, their bodies and their posture. So usually in life you think about your posture all the time and you have to look good and everything. And then you go out into the forest and you walk for 30 seconds through a landscape like this and suddenly and you, haven't, you realize that you haven't thought about your body posture for an, anything at all. You just, you become, the body becomes a tool to go, come through the landscape, which is very comforting then in a very sort of, uh, yeah, in this uh, hyper-mediatized body fixation of our time. Uh, the authenticity is also connected to sort of connecting to who you were as a child, because most of our um, interlocutors have their first experience in nature as children. When they were kids, they would go out alone and play, or they would be there with their grandparents, or they have sort of sweet childhood memories connected to nature. And they sort of reconnect with these memories when they go out in the forest. And that 
also feels like reconnecting to their own personal selves as they used to be. Uh, and in a sense, the way they were when they were authentic and true to themselves, this kind of um, authentic self uh, narrative. Uh, and this also connects them to previous generations and their parents and grandparents and, and the, the, the cottage in some remote province in the country where they grew up and had their first forest experiences. Okay, so these are some of the things that we, we discovered. Uh, and then the question uh, then is, is this what we, now there's no more pictures, you just get to watch this nice picture of, of an industry. Now the question is, is then this what the type of sacred experiences that uh, uh, Rudolf Otto and Eliade are, are explaining? And I suppose, I mean, if you want to take their model and, or the Eliadian model and, and place it on this type of material, you could do this. There are certain similarities. Uh, and most striking is this, the binary. Um, this, um, this, the binary thing, this, the, the nature as something wholly other, going to a different place and sort of a different mood of experience and sort of, it's, it's very different in, in many ways. And I suppose you could make an Eliadian take on that finding. Um, there are also some elements in the way they experience nature that resemble uh, these, um, uh, the Eliadian descriptions of um, the sacred, for instance, the self dissolution and, um, and the, the sense of connection and, and sort of the, the, the reconnection with previous generations and so on. Uh, but you needn't do this analysis. You could also uh, situate these experiences in, in the particular historical uh, time that we live in. And it's striking then, if you make a historical analysis of this type of sentiments, this type of nature romantic sentiments that these um, interlocutors express, it becomes clear that this developed in complete parallel to the actual real life um, disassociation between everyday life and nature. So when people got detached from the landscape, de facto detached, uh, at the same time as they did that, this love of nature uh, uh, developed. And this othering, you could say, uh, just to make this uh, very briefly, you could say that Throughout the 20th century in this country, or actually from the mid 19th century, this process started in Sweden and many other uh, similar countries, where a very near to nature kind of uh, life, where work life, the light, uh, the light, the food you ate, the, the, the work assignments that you had, you, the clothes you were wearing, everything was deeply interdependent on the actual landscape around you. Uh, we have seen a development where that complete interconnectedness with nature was changed to a complete disconnectedness from nature. And I think in step after step after step, in 150 years, we can see this development. Uh, and the love of that nature is the love of the nature which was lost. And then just one final sentence is to say <laughs> that this sort of, um, the love of nature then that, come, that these informants express is sort of a reaction on that detachment, but they are then a part of the same movement or same historical trend that also Rudolf Otto and Michia Eliade were, because they were also reacting against uh, modernity. And in the sense then, if we find the ideas of uh, Eliade and Otto in the, in the, in the witnesses or reports of these people, well, that's not surprising because they are part of the same romantic movement that developed as Thank a part. You. Thank you. Uh, uh, please stand up. Because, because you've also found, found that people describe moments when they feel some kind of sacrality in the wood, but they try to avoid a religious language in expressing this. Is that so? Yes. Um, well, this, this language is a big theme for these, uh, in, in, the, in this study because... Um, they, they are very reluctant to articulate these experiences and they are strongly connected to their own individuality and their feeling of having a unique experience. And they, want, they don't want to sort of flatten this experience out by uh, labeling it uh, with anything 
uh, that sounds too religious. Mm. So some of them would use words, the word magical is sometimes used, but holy and sacred and religious. If they use these terms, they would do this uh, quotation marks or, or say, no, it's almost religious or religion-like or something. And how do you interpret this? Well, I, I think uh, it, uh, there are several explanations for this reluctance. And one is, uh, of course, uh, the, the sort of linguistic history uh, of these terms in the Swedish language and how secularity has sort of uh, alienated these terms for most people. Mm -hmm. So they are associated to things that religion has become associated to, to which they are not really um, fond of sort of getting connected to. But also, of course, it flattens out the experience. Mm -hmm. And language has this, uh, if you think of a tree, for instance, think of a child that uh, knows a tree or climbs in a tree. Mm. Uh, the tree will be a very uh, sort of rich experience. It will be the wind, the, the noise of the wind through the leaves. It will be the smell of the bark, uh, the, 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 the excitement of climbing it, the, the memory of the mother lifting it, the child up, and all things like this. Mm. And then when you learn the word tree, this rich experience will shrink to a symbol of a visual tree. Mm. When you hear tree, immediately we'll see this. So Otto's, language flattens yeah. out reality. One of Rudolf Otto's criteria is tremendum, little scary, overwhelming, yes. something even, even dangerous, might even be evil. Uh, you describe more feel-good sensations yes, yes. when Swedes walk in the wood. Do you find any of the... There's not much tremendum. There is some mysterium and there's some fascinance, but there's not much tremendous. And uh, it's a very domesticated nature that these people... Um, actually, th this might be driven by the, the fact that we have made interviews in various sort of city near... Uh, no forest. people who have got lost in the forest. Uh, no, and it's, uh, we expected to find things like um, the call of the wild, the sort of mm. uh, the wild, uh, rough, yeah. pre-modern yeah. uh, thing. But not much of that. Mm -hmm. It's a very domesticated, kind and nice place for all no. of them. I have more questions. I'll come yeah. back to them. Thank you very much. This Thank part. you. I promise you that we would discuss uh, churches as a social platform for religion. And Alan Guggenbuhl will talk about this, I think. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'll start with the story. Something I experienced some time ago, I work with juveniles, adolescents with, with problematic backgrounds, so they send to me, and it's often difficult to connect with them. So I make walking tours through their turf in order to get uh, in discussion with them. And I had an experience with one uh, a juvenile adolescent, and he was all dressed up in his garment, and so he showed me his bars, and so and he showed me his peers, and suddenly he went another way, walked to a church. And he said, well, this is strange. So and then he uh, opened the door, we entered the church, and I saw, uh, you know, leaflets uh, of the climate change, save the climate, uh, black life matter, things like that. And he walked in, and we looked around, and it was bare, nobody was around, and he said, that's the proof that Europe is doomed. You don't respect God. Now, for me, this, of course, you know, my first reaction was, well, okay, he's from this uh, Orient, this background, he's not knowledgeable, you know, I'm a European, and I started reacting. We have enlightenment, we are critical thinking, we're not adherents of the church. So that was my very first thought. But then I thought, maybe he's right. Maybe he has a, an argument. And um, I started to do some reflection. Now, if we think of us, actually, we're... Um, with the descendants of hunter-gatherers. And an interesting American psychologist, right? They said, well, if you if we would be there here now and we would be outside in nature, we would be freezing. If we wouldn't have any knowledge of about, about sicknesses, you know, suddenly some one of us would die. And so, so it's actually our, our, pre, our forefathers lived in a completely different environment. They had a lot of things which they could not understand, could not uh, foresee. They didn't have time, for instance. So time had a diff completely different quality. It was a completely different way of life.
And this led to attributions to the surrounding. You know, why is it thundering? Why, why is this animal so completely different? Our, the minds constantly were irritated by what was going along. This also led, as we know from nomadic con uh, cultures, to kind of attribute uh, certain qualities to certain places, like Kailash, you know, the Tibetan holy mountains, you know, and other Brittany's who said, well, every, everywhere there might be something going on, some other spirituals, gods, and so So this is actually where, um, where we come from. And as you know, and Shalik, you probably know him, describes very, um, very uh, cleverly, we, we live in an urban society, has been mentioned before. And urban societies, of course, completely different. So in urban societies, it's us, we, our consciousness, our knowledge, which defines our surrounding. So we might hear when there's a thunder, but we're inside, secu secure. We, we know how to feed each other. So we actually can, we can define the surrounding. And the things we do... Actually, we, we can preconceive them. So we can say, well, tomorrow I'll probably go on the, on the bus and then Saturday I'll go on a plane, I'll sleep in a, in a bed and it's warm, the, the windows are, are fine. And so, so we actually, actually we're programmed, we can identify what we will do, we can plan ourselves. And so that is actually what urban societies are. Urban societies have, of course, tremendous challenges. One challenge is to get along with each other. Because, you know, all these different people with different notions, with different expectations, that's a tremendous challenge. And that's why we have stories. That's why we have paradigms. That we have, that's why we have myths with which we can understand. So this is a, a tremendous uh, the, uh, change. But we have to realize this urban life, of course, influence, has a tremendous influence, influence on us. In for, so actually the places, the situations we meet, we live in a profane world, like has, uh, has been mentioned. And this experience of the sacred, this experience of the unknown, this experience of going somewhere where there's another reality is rather rare. I think even in nature, I think mentally we started to colonize nature. You know, we think, oh, nature is good for me. It's good, like uh, it's, it's been described. So we colonize everything, actually. So we're actually detached maybe from, uh, from nature or from sacred spaces. Sacred spaces is actually a rarity. So we're not... Now, I want to tell you a, t a second story. Something I experienced a long time ago when I had a friend from Spain and we went to Spain. We went to this Andalusian village. I was about, I think, 19 or 20. And for some odd reason, we went to church. And uh, we were sitting there in church. We had to kneel down, stand up, kneel down. And the clergyman was in front of us and he showed his back to us. He never, ever faced us. And he mumbled something in Latin. We hadn't a clue what he was talking about. And I still remember the reaction of the congregations. Some were bored, irritated. Some, you know, were trying to understand something. So it was like a very strange community. But we started to talk about it. I got, he got a bit angry. I got a bit confused. And so it somehow did something with us. It's something, it, it's something, uh, it, it, it caused a reaction in us. We started to imagine things. Now, I think it's, very important to see what actually had happened. And here I want to talk about consciousness. Consciousness is a very interesting neurological research made by Holmes. Why are, what is the purpose of consciousness? And I think one purpose is that um, we actually have a, we, a lot of the instincts, a lot of the intelligence, a lot of the gray matters we use, which has been already said, is actually used unconsciously. You know, while I stand here, probably a lot of gray matter is now uh, occupied by keeping me my balance. You know, when I go like this, there's an alarm probably in my head saying, just stand still. So we, a lot of the, our incompetence actually goes automatically. But uh, consciousness apparently one could see uh, uh, emerged because uh, because of 
events because of disturbances which we did not understand, cannot understand. So consciousness can be perceived as an attempt to bridge the outer and the inner, the outer inner, to try to, to, to make a link with the outer and the inner. So there's an inner world, that means not to the body, like it's been meant, the body which sends sensations and impulses, but also not just the body, the inner world is also, of course, images, fantasies. And as Sudendorf says, images, the imagination is one of the key uh, uh, competences of human beings that he can imagine. Human beings are actually a bit crazy because they often follow the image, imaginations. They follow scenes which they imagine and have no connection to the reality. So that's why we are actually often not pleased. And that's why, as uh, someone said, uh, students, like Jessica said, students go and travel the whole world because it's the imagination. That's very important. And uh, now, in order to understand what he actually said, I think it's very important to reflect on our attitude and our notion. Now, we have the notion, and this is part of enlightenment, result of enlightenment, and the result of the profane world, that we understand things. Understanding means, as has been said with the tree, excellently, we tag it, we, we reduce it. And when we understand something, we take away its power. Actually, it might have no influence. And I think this notion of understanding is actually something which detaches us from other experiences, an experience of otherness, an experience of the tremendum, an experience of the, the sacred world, the experience that we don't know anything, that probably our sensation, we all were presented a very limited scope of what is happening. I think that's, and this understanding is actually a power, of course, but it's also a problem. I think so. Actually, we need perhaps uh, uh, more irritations. I think we need really, and irritations is not something mentally, because as I said, like nature, we start to understand nature. And now we want to save the world. We start to understand what's going on in the world. And I'm not sure. And I think we, if we kind of uh, confront ourselves with places and situations which we don't understand, then this causes a reaction where we might produce, create more imagery, more uh, uh, if, uh, images, you know, ideas in order to step into the, uh, to the otherness. In Germany, they say the, we are the geworfenheit of our beings into the world. We're thrown into the world and actually we probably understand the very limited, but we have to be prepared to understand uh, that we just don't understand, actually. That, I think, is a danger. Also, you know, it's interesting um, that when we, this is an, an, another psychologist, Gelern, Gelernter, he's called Gelernter because he's American, and he wrote a book, when it does actually the intelligence expand? When do people have new ideas? When are people actually touched by something? And it's clear to him, to his research, it's not when we're concentrated. It's not when we focus. It's not when we kind of dwell on something. It's when we're in a distractive mode. It's when we browse. It's when we walk. It's when we blabber. It's when we fool around. That's when the new ideas come. It's when we're touched. It's when we're angry. So it needs this stage, which is important. So coming back to this, and a lot of coming back to this is, as I said, irritations actually is, 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 is important to be really, to have this tremendum. And uh, as been said, now we kind of we seek it somewhere else, but in a very shallow way, maybe in Netflix, some slight irritation there. And so, but we, we fail to allow ourselves this deep, uh, this deep kind of uh, sacrifice, not sacrificing, but kind of give orphan height into to this phenomenal experience. And I think there, that's what this youngster meant when he said that. He said, because of that, you know, it's interesting. In Europe, if you uh, ask anyone and said, well, what is your relation to church? And so what is your relation to God? And I think, well, I think it's important, you know, religions, but I'm a non-believer. That's an interesting phenomenon. 
you rarely have people, if someone comes and said, I'm a believer, well, he's a bit, you know, so. So we have to think of that. And according to him, that's the problem. We are not believers. We are all non-believers, but we stand aside and study religion. And so and maybe that's one of the traps. Maybe that's one of the disenfranchisements. I don't have an answer to this. So, but uh, because I, I consider myself also skeptical and looking at it, but I think it's one of the notions which this youngster, you know, might have told me. If you're not a non-believer, you don't have a, a, a kind of relig- you can't have a religious experience. You can't have it. You're actually you're detached. You're lost. That's why, according to him, Europe is doomed. So on these happy words, I want to end. <laughs> yeah. uh, the first. I kept time, did I? Yeah, you For did that. perfectly. Yeah. Uh, the first story you you told us about the guy going into the church and mm. finding all the pamphlets about climate crisis. And, I found them. Yes. Yes. What 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 was the I didn't really grasp the message the message was he wanted to prove to me that europe is is lost that's what he wanted and why is why is europe lost because, to because the church nobody was in the church it was no energy in it it was empty there's no people there there was no singing chanting praying it was just empty and uh, he presented me other places you know shops bars and things and now look at the church People don't even go to church anymore. They don't kind of And you value. need this, the church as a social platform for religious practice. Well, originally, that was the purpose, probably. Yes. You know, church, when churches came, people uh, went into church in order to connect. But mm-hmm. the church somehow adapted to mainstream. That's why I mentioned this on the, uh, the you know, the, mm-hmm. when you walked into church, you had these leaflets about climate change, mm-hmm. solidarity. So church somehow adapted to the profane world. Yes. And through that, they actually lost their gist. Yeah. And you said understanding reduces the, the mystic of things. I didn't quite understand. No, I, uh, <laughs> I'm not joking. I just said understanding, if you understand something, yeah. there's always a danger that you lose a certain quality, yes. you know, a certain transcendent quality. And now yes. my point is science today is understanding more and more and more. So the danger is increasing. I'm not too sure. If you say that science more and more and more, maybe it's less and less and less. You know, that's that's one of our kind of conceitedness. We think, well, science is developing and nowhere in time science has reached that height. Of course, I think the same thing, but I'm not sure. Maybe, you know, we're losing out in many issues. Hmm? Very nice this far, and okay. I look forward to meet you again. Wouter okay. Hanegraaf on Esot. Esotericism, I have practiced on that word for many times, but I failed even this time. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. I'm not actually going to talk about esotericism. <laughs> uh, to understand the meaning of the sacreds, I believe we need to explore, first of all, what is meant by modernity. Uh, and the one, in my view, cannot be uh, understood without the other. The French poet Charles Baudelaire, gave the term modernity. He may not have coined the term, but he certainly gave it a specific meaning that is highly relevant to its later career. In an essay about modern art published in 1863. Baudelaire was discussing a contemporary painter, whom you see on the right, whose work he admired and knew personally, Constantin Guy. And it may be helpful to show an image here, indeed, uh, of one of his works. So there you have one of the works by Guy. Uh, Baudelaire described Guy as a solitary man with a great gift of imagination, who was always wandering through the great desert of humanity, as he puts it, in pursuit of an elusive goal. And here's the famous quotation by Baudelaire. He, Guy, is looking for that undefinable something, which we may be allowed to call modernity, for want of a better term to express the idea in question. The aim for him is to extract from fashion the poetry that resides in its historical envelope. So to distill the eternal from the transitory. Modernity is the transitory, the fugitive, the contingent. 
that one half of art, of which the other half is the eternal, the immovable. The painting by Guy shows a fashionable cocktail, part, uh, cocktail reception, uh, as you can see, with two elegant women surrounded by obviously interested men. On the strictly empirical level of the senses, the level of positivist science, there is nothing else to be seen. And yet, if we watch this painting closely, we may realize that there is something faintly spectral or ghostly about it, as if the painter wants to make us wonder is this really all there is? And that is in fact the essence of Baudelaire's remark. Uh, when he defines modernity as the transitory, the fugitive, the contingent, as opposed to the eternal and the immovable. Baudelaire was writing in the midst of the 19th century when under the impact of radical scientific and political developments, the pace of human society was speeding up in an unprecedented frenzy of transformation. As a result, almost everything that had once been considered stable and permanent seemed to be giving way to a dazzling experience of continuous change, a never-ending succession of rapid, transit, uh, rapid transitions affecting all levels of society, resulting in a faintly hallucinatory sense that reality consisted not of any stable and reliable truths, but of only fleeting and transitory impressions. The direct relevance of this phenomenon to the sacred is explicit, for instance, in a famous passage from Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, the Communist Manifesto of 1848. You've all heard about it. All that is solid melts into air. All that is sacred is profaned. And human beings are at last compelled to face with sober senses their real conditions of life and their relations to one another. Therefore, modernity implied an acute sense of conflict between the cherished idea of permanent stable values on the one hand and the actual human experience of impermanence and instability. The opposition ultimately leads us back all the way to the origins of Greek philosophy and its central concern with how that which really is, ta onta, is related to that which is merely passing, being and becoming. Since the Middle Ages, Plato's key distinction between the world of eternal forms or ideas and the ultimately illusory world of changing appearances led to classic concepts of uh, the world as a great chain of being with impermanence in the center and stability in the periphery and beyond it. But this somewhat static picture of universal providential harmony began to break down under the impact of unprecedented processes of change and transformation since the 16th and the 17th centuries. The so-called temporalization of the chain of being, an expression by Ezo Lovejoy in the great chain of being, uh, the temporalization of the chain of being is also known as the rise of historical consciousness since the 18th century. This led to various forms of evolutionism that gained uh, dominance during the 19th century and are best interpreted as responses, responses to the specter of complete historical relativism. History as nothing but one damn thing after another. A mere succession of random events without any meaningful direction or plot. These evolutionist approaches to history suggested that continuous change and transformation were parts of a forward movement of improvement or progress. Hence, the ideal of a stable and permanent truth might no longer reside in a metaphysical realm beyond the senses, but could still be attained or at least approached at some point in the future. This confidence in modernization as a movement of progress began to weaken towards the final decades of the 19th century and suffered a fatal blow with the carnage of the two world wars. Now it had become hard to imagine a reality of stable truth, either spatially as residing in some higher metaphysical realm or temporally or historically as the telos of the historical or evolutionary process. It's against this background, I think, that influential scholars and intellectuals came to see modernity not as a positive phenomenon of evolution and progress, but as a largely negative process, grounded in the decline or the eclipse of the sacred. In this regard, the Romanian historian of religions, Darius again, 
of course, Mircea Eliade, is just the most famous representative of an important intellectual tradition that emerged in the context of the annual so-called Eranos meetings in Switzerland from 1933 to 88. The Eranos tradition and its central concern with the sacred is utterly central to how the study of religion developed, especially in the USA after World War II. It is crucial to see that both historically and in terms of its basic ideas, Eranos was a typical product of high modernity. This was a high modern movement. Its agenda consisted in finding ways to preserve or to revive the sacred, equivalent to what Baudelaire had called the eternal and the immovable, as a necessary antidote against the modern experience of the terror of history. Mercier Eliade's equivalent for the transitory, the fugitive, the contingent, as expressed by Baudelaire. The Eranos approach to religion is often referred to as religionism today in professional uh, terminology, and it has come under heavy criticism, roughly since the 1980s, with the rise of a new style of academic scholarship that has gained ever more dominance in the humanities, including the study of religion in recent years. While the term postmodernity may be problematic for reasons that do not need to concern us here, this new approach certainly takes a crucial step beyond modernity, as defined above, with far-reaching consequences for how we think about the sacred. In the most general terms, high modernity was marked by deep anxiety, deep anxiety over what would happen to Western culture and society if the eternal and the immovable Baudelaire, would vanish altogether and only the transitory, the fugitive, the contingent would remain. By contrast, the postmodern condition may be defined in terms of full acceptance. Full acceptance and even an enthusiastic embrace of the very disappearance of any transcendent reference. Behind the surface of appearances, there can no longer be any dimension of depth. In terms of Jacques Derrida's deconstruction, there can strictly be no room for a transcendental signified in the technical terminology of his work, obviously including the sacred, because discourse consists exclusively of an infinite self-referential play of signifiers that never refer to anything else than to one another. In terms of Michel Foucault's perspective, the order of discourse is not ruled by the search for knowledge and truth, but ultimately by the quest for power. The disappearance of the sacred in contemporary scholarship, as well as in popular culture, is therefore not a contingency. It is something that follows with strict necessity from the inherent logic of these very uh, influential post-structural perspectives. In the current academic context, these developments have led to a complete disjunction between two approaches. On one hand, a religionist discourse of the sacred, understood as a real presence or transcendent signified, in Derrida's terms. And secondly, a broadly post-structuralist approach, which also goes under such names as theory or critique, in which the sacred cannot possibly be present except as yet another empty signifier. Against or in between both parad paradigms, I've personally always defended a third intermediary perspective. An empiricist, bottom-up historicism on methodologically agnostic foundations, in which a transcendental signified is neither affirmed or assumed, nor denied or excluded. Like the post-structuralist, I see references to the sacred strictly as discursive claims that cannot be verified by scholarly method. But unlike Derrida, I assume that a transcendent presence or signified or text beyond the text may well exist and might even possibly appear in our world of experience, whether we notice it or not. And unlike Foucault, I believe that the quest for knowledge and understanding cannot, need not, and should not be reduced to a game of hegemonic power strategies. Although I therefore cannot affirm, along with the Eranos religionist and Eliade and others, that the sacred is present, still I do believe that they were right, at least in their profound anxiety, about the decline of a transcendent reverend in Western culture and its negative effects on society and the human mind. 
belief in the sacred really means belief in a foundation of ultimate meaning. A meaning that is stable and permanent enough to endure in spite of radical contingency and continuous change. Meaning, by the way, is an interesting word. There's a footnote here. As you can still see in such expressions as the common mean, it is closely linked to the concept of mediation, defined as a concept, a place or a state that is halfway between extremes. That is meaning. Meaning is precisely that which somehow mediates between signifiers, such as words or images, and their reference, the signified. Hence the closeness of meaning and significance. In fact, the standard Dutch translation of meaning is betekenis, signification. Okay, that was the footnote. Now, if we call something sacred, what we are really saying, I think, and it's here comes to the conclusion of my short talk, what we are really saying when we call something sacred is that we feel it must be protected. Why do we feel so? Because we feel it is meaningful. It has to be protected because it is meaningful to our lives somehow. Now, paradoxically, precisely that which later which earlier generations claimed to be most stable and permanent, the sacred, appears to be so vulnerable today that it must be carefully preserved from contamination and erosion by the forces of impermanence and change. Against these backgrounds, the suggestion that I want to make is that the legitimate core of the religionist Aaron's argument can actually be saved by asking more specifically what it is that human beings consider to be meaningful and in need of protection. The most consistent answer of Western metaphysics is that this sacred domain consists of three interrelated concerns traditionally referred to as the transcendentals, the good, the beautiful, and the true. This triad is implicit already in Plato. It was systematized during the Middle Ages and it forms the basis of Immanuel Kant's famous free critiquen pure reason, truth, judgment, beauty, and practical reason, the good. As regards the search for human meaning under conditions of modernity and beyond modernity, my advice would therefore be uh, to actually move the discussion away from the sacred and maybe not talk about the sacred anymore, but instead move the discussion towards discussion of the transcendentals, the good, the beautiful, and the true. The object of such a discussion, I think, should not be to decide what is good, what is beautiful, and what is true. You know, I think this is good, and I think that is beautiful. Interesting as such discussions may be, these will lead us straight back into the never-ending discourse of realm of mere opinions and claims. Rather, the object, I think, should be to delineate some core of basic human values that cannot be reduced to discourse, and therefore cannot be deconstructed, or even understood in terms of competition and power. The kinds, of, the kinds of basic human values, in other words, that we feel deserve to be protected. Thank you. <laughs> Who can do this work of protecting the transcendentals? Is that the United Nations or is it the European Union? Is it the Pope, the Church, no, martial I think, arts? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the most important ones are educators. I think this is a matter of education, not only in classrooms, etc., but also uh, education through writing in any kind of ways. Anybody who communicates and educates the general audience, the general, you know, wider public. And uh, I think education in that sense, and this is very important for me as a scholar in the humanities, education has to be based upon a uh, deep understanding of the historical uh, trajectories that have brought us to where we are nowadays. And um, this is something that, that I worry about. I think that we see in the past couple of decades a decline of historical scholarship, a decline of knowledge about intellectual history, cultural history. These things are seen increasingly in, in, in the standard, uh, standard educational trajectories. Mm. Could this that we, be done that do universally? Do. Because I don't quite sure that these three transcendentals are, are universal values. Well, this is uh, what Plato said and what Kant said. And uh, so uh, there's a strong do, tradition do, of people. Do Western uh, guys 
Western guys. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it is, I, uh, it is basically, it is about the, the fundamental question. Yeah. Can we distinguish between truth and error? Can we decide what is good and what is not good in our lives in general, in the way we, we behave and whatever we do? And also, uh, uh, beauty is the most interesting one, maybe, because at least in the platonic sense, it is the most, uh, it's actually the ultimate one. Uh, beauty is the original reality that we have lost in this process of transitoriness, uh, uh, history, etc. that Baudelaire talks about. That's actually the most problematic one, but uh, also maybe the most interesting one. So, uh, so I do think that that the very fundamental questions of can we distinguish truth between uh, be, between truth and error, and goodness and uh, what is good and what's not good, mm. are such fundamental questions which are very difficult to actually debate in those terms under the radical under the conditions of radical postmodernity as I defined it. And this is a problem. I think we have to ask those questions and keep answer, asking those questions, not in a way to of going back beyond postmodernity because I think we have to take on board what we can learn from these perspectives mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm very impressed by someone like Derrida, for instance. It's very, very impressive philosophy. So you have to take that very seriously. But you cannot stay there. We have to move move beyond postmodernity towards something else, and I think that means, among other things, asking the very basic questions that we have have been asking for many centuries, and that we, in a certain way, have stopped asking. Have or, you noticed any awakening in this sense? Any awakening? I. Uh, or is this yeah, your own idea that you're fighting for, or do you have any adherence? Uh, the way I actually see, a, well, not in this term. Well, yes and no. I mean, I see a lot of a uh, lot of that around me in many circles, not necessarily in academic circles. Although, actually, when I talk about this, I I see there is a lot of record. The longing for beauty yeah, of that. Yeah, not just beauty, but goodness and truth. And what is that? Yeah. Um, um, so I think implicitly it's there, uh, but I think it has to be put on the agenda and actually thematized in a way like this is something we have to talk about.